Hey, everybody, welcome back to uh, the podcast here with Dr. Jake and Sweetwater Holistic. I am with one of the bright, shining minds in the cannabis world, my friend from LinkedIn, Ruth Fisher. Ruth uh, has um, a PhD in economics, and she did her bachelor's in mathematics, and she has written two books. One, winning the hardware software game, uh, using game theory to optimize uh, the pace of new technology adoption, and also the medical cannabis primer, ushering in the golden age of marijuana. Uh, Welcome uh, so much, Ruth. Folks can find you at quanta.com, Q-U-A-N-T-A-A.com. Just please share with folks a little bit about yourself and what you are up to and have been doing uh, these days. First of all, let me say it's such a pleasure to be here. I know we've had a couple of conversations and I always just so enjoy them. We we end up in, in so many different, uh, very interesting discussions. So thank you again for inviting me. Um, I have an unusual background when it comes to people in cannabis. I uh, was very clearly colored by the stigma um, I had used it in uh, cannabis in, in college and grad school, decided it wasn't really my thing. Um, try I try to be very libertarian in my view. So I try to say, you know, if other people want to use it, that's fine. That's up to them. Um, but I grew up in the area of this is your brain on drugs um, and was uh, heavily kind of bought into that. Um, and then in about 2015, um, my brother came to me. And he said, um, so he had been he had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and he gets really, really bad multifaceted neuropathic pain. Um, and he had been struggling with that for for a long time. And he tried literally everything out there. I mean, every medication, every device, every procedure. Um, and it's still none of it was was really satisfactory. Um, and then, so he came to me and he said, I've been using cannabis and I'm like, really? And he said, and it's actually helping with the pain. And I was, I fell off my chair and he said, but I'm not getting great effects. And I, I figured that if I knew what I was doing, I would probably be able to get better effects. Can you help me figure this out? So at that point, knowing um, how much he had been struggling, um, and I'm sure there's so many people in your audience, uh, Dr. Jake, who have had either themselves or loved ones who've been plagued by some chronic problem that the traditional medical system hasn't been able to help them with. And it's really heart-wrenching to see someone you love, you know, suffer like that. And so I was actually thrilled to finally be able to do something to help him. And so I jumped into cannabis saying, let's figure this out. So that's kind of my introduction into cannabis and and how I got into this weird and wacky space. Um, So as I said, I knew nothing. I just started reading everything. So the reason he came to me is my background is in, first of all, market research understanding different markets. I'd spent a lot, a lot of time in healthcare. So I was very familiar with the healthcare industry and journals and journal articles and information and whatnot. Um, And the market research is, you know, understanding information and collating it and finding meaning in it. So that was kind of what my background is. And so healthcare, my areas of passion are healthcare, um, education, feel very strongly about schools and education. And the last one is technology adoption. I've been fascinated by technology adoption in society um, and how how technology shapes the types of technologies invented. And then technology turns around and shapes people's behavior. So I've been fascinated by that and following that. Oh, Um, I love this. Love this. (laughs) Okay. So you've been following it. That fascinates me too. Um, I've got a bunch of threads going. So talk to me about finding meaning in the data. And then I'm I'm formulating these ideas because I want to bring it back to this article you wrote recently on placebo effect, but I'm just pulling these threads together. So talk to, to, to me about finding meaning. 
Okay. So I'm in the process. I posted something yesterday on LinkedIn and there've been a lot of comments and it provides a perfect example. And the issue was in California, um, people that, uh, and I forget exactly the, the name of the group, it was uh, the Rocky Mountain um, something, something in Colorado. And they put out a report on traffic fatalities um, involving people who had tested positive for cannabis. And they say, if you look at when cannabis was legalized, the number of traffic fatalities are going up and the proportion of fatalities where people, the driver tested positive for cannabis is also going up. So it went up, went from 11% of total fatalities, people, the driver testing positive for cannabis in 2014 or 13, uh, no, cannabis was legalized for adult use in 2012. So it must have been 2011 or 12. And then now you go up and it's about 22%. Now, they don't state it directly, but the obvious implication there is cannabis is causing more people to have traffic fatalities. So I said, okay, let's think about this. <laughs> okay, first of all, we know just because you have cannabis in your blood doesn't mean that you're impaired. And we know- That's that correct. It can be weeks later. Yes. And we know that, um, I mean, cannabis was legalized, so obviously more people are going to be using it. So more people in any slice of the population are going to test positive for cannabis. So it's natural that more drivers involved in accidents will test positive. But then you say, well, why are accidents going up? And I kind of lost sight of kind of one of the big pictures. And people were saying, well, the population went up really quickly during that period. So you don't want to look at just accidents. You want to look at accidents as a percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. But my point is, is, you know, when you look at accidents and there's something else, and this goes towards my uh, passion with um, technology in society, at exactly 2012, there's been a lot of research by a guy named Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, uh, and he's looking at, um, he's a behavioral uh, psychologist. Okay. He's been doing a lot, a lot of work on how um, depression and suicide in teens, females, and males has been going up over time in kind of this environment of malaise that we're, we're feeling right now. And he traces it back to 2012 when smartphones were introduced. Ah. And so when you think about that, they even have a term for driving while using either texting or on the phone. It's called distracted driving. So exactly when the number of accidents started increasing, lo and behold, I mean, it, it the, the the actually the introduction of uh, cannabis into the legal cannabis into Colorado coincided exactly with the introduction of smartphones. And when you're doing the analysis, this is called omitted variable bias. When you leave something out and what you're capturing then, what you do include, it looks like that's causing the problem. Whereas in reality, it's the thing that you're leaving out that's causing the problem. And so that was kind of the point that I was making is the people doing the analysis, generally people doing an analysis have an agenda and they're trying to find a specific result. And that means that they're seeing thing through, things through a lens. And so they're seeing the increases in, in fatalities and they're in, seeing the increases in the percentage of fatalities where the driver is testing positive for cannabis. And for them, they're not looking for alternatives. So they're focused on the conclusion they want to draw that cannabis is causing the problem. So that's what I'm saying. Let's look at the bigger context and try and kind of figure out what's really going on, not just what we kind of want to find. I uh, yes, and I I don't know that there. I mean, just for me personally, I know I have an agenda. I do, I do, because I have I, and so I have to admit that to myself. I have seen cannabis do wonderful things for my patients, for my friends, for my family, and I've also seen cannabis do not so great things for me personally in my world recreationally, but topically, they're fantastic for me. And so I definitely have a lens, but I also um, realize that data and the real world can inform, and it is not necessarily about being right, but about course correction a lot of the time. And and um, but I'm particularly fascinated by this smartphone phenomenon. The increase in suicidality, um, because 
I mean, let's face it, I'm old school. I've seen changes in culture, many of which I don't like, but I remember my grandfather complaining and we can go all the way back to Plato and they've had this problem. Yeah. Uh, humans have had this problem for a, um, a long time. So I'd like to interject there just real please. quick. So yes, it's probably an age old thing that, you know, the older people say, well, kids these days, on the other hand, I will note, and this is something that I've discovered in my travels of researching technology and society, that the pace of things are changing so quickly today that when you go back, you know, say to the middle ages, if you look at the environment and the world that your kids or grandkids are growing up in during the Middle Ages, it's very, very similar to the world that you grew up in, just because there have, hasn't been a lot of change in the environment, no new technologies, no real changes in the standard of living or anything. But today, things are changing so quickly that, you know, I think that there are really big differences between the world that we're growing up in and, say, our kids and grandkids are growing up in. 100%. And I remember I was living in Nagoya, Japan. It was the late, mid, late 90s. And some pundit made the observation that really not much has changed for us uh, with this new internet that everybody had since the Brady Bunch and when you had dial phones. But you compare. Th so for me, I mean, I, I totally, yeah, there's not much changed. And, but now it's very, very different. So I want to, I want to, now thread this back to the article that you wrote on placebo effect, because you had mentioned the importance of set and setting in that article. And could this cell phone, smartphone, tablet phenomenon be a huge part of the set and setting of humanity? And I just to tie it into, I've been kind of doing my uh, flow apprenticeship and I was thinking about doom scrolling the other day and that folks are getting that dopamine hit, which you also yeah. get in flow, but there's not a skill element involved. Anyway, that's a bit of a sidetrack, but I'm just opening yeah. that up. So, so, so maybe c let's consider that in the context of set and setting and maybe placebo or mind body connection. And I'll kick it back to you, Ruth. So um, I had, I'd, I've spent a lot of time doing uh, analyses in different areas of cannabis because I'm, I'm just so fascinated by it. And there's so many different areas to explore. Um, and at some point, I realized that there was kind of a connection there. And I ended up tying a couple of different pieces together. And so the paper I wrote, it said, OK, if you look before about the 1950s, and this goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, to or as far back as medicine being practiced in ancient society. And this goes up through about 1950. So there were no real medicines out there. Now I'm gonna abstract from the whole issue of herbal medicine and just focus on kind of Western or sophisticated. And, and I, I hate putting labels like that. They're so full of nuance and I don't mean to um, dismiss the effectiveness of herbal remedies, but just looking at kind of what Western medicine or the traditional healthcare industry would consider real medicine, you know, in that vein, there were no real medicines out there um, throughout history. And so patients come to doctors and doctors really can't give them anything that will realistically, physiologically cure their problems, treat infections, heal wounds, you know, the cold, the flu, you know, whatever it is they're suffering, the doctors couldn't do anything real to help them. And so what they did is they relied on the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is the idea that you can use set and setting, and we'll get to that later, but anything other than something that's actually curative, physiologically curative, acting on the body, using your mind and expectations to get people to kind of cure themselves. <laughs> and so doctors, what they did is they enabled the placebo effect in patients. They provided a person of authority and respect and, you know, uh, someone who presumably knew what they were doing. Um, and they came up with all these rituals and concoctions that helped people kind of make believe that they were getting something legitimate and then their body would heal themselves. 
And so it was kind of play acting in a sense. And I don't mean to be judgmental here, but I'll be using this terminology. Um, and the the patients played into it. And, and a lot of the patients were healed just because they ended up healing themselves. And the doctors all along knew that they weren't doing anything real, that it was kind of, you know, a, a, a show, but this is kind of their job. And so in that sense, medicine is an art. There's no real science involved. It's an art. And um, it's it's using figuring out the art of medicine to help help your patients as much as you can. Wonderful. Oh, I have so much to to say, and I want to be extracting from your brain and not mine. But I love this concept of play acting. Yeah, I took a. I took a couple, I was a, I was a psych major at Penn state and I took a couple and mostly I focused on industrial psychology and human performance. It fascinates me, but I took a couple side courses. And in one, in one case, there was a shaman performing a rite or a ritual. Actually, there were a number of shamans, but this particular shaman had a trick that he used before the event. He would take a tuft of down feather and put it in his cheek and when he would do and i am a big fan of indigenous populations and i would be happy to push back on whether or not it was real medicine but i don't think that that's what's important in this case he knowingly would do the ritual and right. put his mouth to the the person he was treating while he had bitten on the inside of his cheek to cause the blood come out and he'd pull out the bloody tuft of down like magic. Yeah. And he had no cognitive dissonance in and around this. And, and I, if I'm and boy, this is going back to the to the 80s when I was looking at this, but his results were better. And the yeah. results of placebo effect is in and around 30 percent. And you can do sham knee surgery where they just make the cuts on the knees and these patients with cartilage degeneration get better it's fascinating and also i would like to say we very much have rites and rituals in modern medicine and i'll name a few yes. one is the white coat which yes. serves absolutely no function yes. you mentioned this in your article sometimes the doctors are stylishly swathing their stethoscopes which these days, most of the time, if you pay attention, they never use. Sometimes they do. But right. anyway, but right. it's it's a prominent prop. And also the right of signing in at the front desk and yes. showing your insurance card in the yes. hole. I hope there's not a problem with my insurance, because if there is, this is, you know, and then making your copay. And then, you, you know, you sign, these are all rights and rituals. And then you are. You are not, you don't go back and see the doctor. You're allowed to go back and see the doctor. Um, so uh, again, set and setting. Um, I think that uh, we can, um, well, anyway, I will kick it back to you because I have a bunch of other threads and I don't want it to get, I want I want to kind of stay on target here, but, but talk a little bit more about that if that brought up anything for you. It Well, that kind of plays into the later stuff. Because so you have in this pre 1950s or so era, it's pretty much placebo effect going on. And, and in the article, I say, well, medicine is an art at this point. They're not using real science. Now, we know that if you go into the shamans and the medicine women and the herbalists, that a lot of that ties into really things that have been discovered now are, are extremely legitimate. But I'm talking about the, you know, the the tonics and you know the barbers and the the, the rhinoceros horn and yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the tiger claw and the tiger claw tea that, and all I that other that stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I have yeah, well, all of that stuff, right, yeah. right, right. So now what happens is it, you get you do get penicillin um, and antibiotics, mm -hmm. and that starts becoming real. And then in the 1950s or so, what happens is you start getting a bunch of of legitimate medications. And at this point, the pharmaceutical companies, everyone is aware of the placebo effect. And in the literature, they say no one talks about it pre 1950s. And all of a sudden around the 1950s, when these legitimate medicines are coming out, 
the everyone recognizes there is a placebo effect and the drug companies are trying to establish that their drugs are legitimate and it's not just placebo. So they recognize the placebo and they say, no, our drugs actually work. It's not placebo. And then all of a sudden there was a huge amount of talk and research about how you can essentially isolate and minimize the placebo effect Double blinding, for example. Yes, exactly. And they're taking great pains and there's this huge discussion about the placebo effect as if it's something that's evil and they don't want and they're minimizing it and trying to eliminate it. And so I say, okay, this is a period where medicine becomes pure science. Now, there's something very interesting there. There's this issue of, well, if everyone understood the placebo effect was being used, but it doesn't appear anywhere in the literature. Why wasn't that? And there were a couple of different reasons. The one that I found most convincing was that doctors recognized that in many cases, what they were doing wasn't real. And they felt shame or guilt that they were play acting or tricking, and in many cases, their patients. And a lot of times they specifically invoked the placebo when they were very frustrated or just knew that they couldn't do anything real to help their patients. I thought that was really interesting. Oh, that's go, so, go so ahead. I'm sorry. Period, it's the 1950s through about uh, 2000 or so is is what I call uh, the science of medicine. So I'll stop there. And then there's one more stage, but I'll let you. Uh, oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So I want to talk about the play acting and um, uh, I want to also maybe for another segue talk about um, individualized treatment and how that we're kind of morphing this That's the third stage. Oh, the great, 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 great. Um, play acting. There is known play acting. You even mentioned it in your articles. Have you ever, have you ever, I know I have, I, and this was before I went to, but, but, but I went and it was like, they gave me these little tiny, tiny, tiny little pills. They were so small. And you mentioned that they, that they, they make them smaller because they don't want you to associate it with aspirin, which is only a so, so effective medicine. Right. We're going to give you this little teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny pill. <laughs> Which by, by the, the implication there, the nuances, it must be really powerful. Exactly. So that's is enhancing this placebo, this mind-body connection. The opposite can occur, and it reminds me of uh, uh, something that I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I don't want to say the name of the book because I, I'm not 100% positive, but it's this idea. Okay, there was this doctor. Uh, there was this doctor who had a patient that because of their condition would come back repeatedly every other week and had been doing so for years. And um, uh, remarkably, some technologic advancement occurred and they found a cure for this disease. And the doctor was so excited he explained it to the patient, but for whatever reason, the patient did not exactly understand what the doctor was saying. A lot of people probably have the experience I know I have in the clinic where my patient is nodding their head and I know they're not getting what I'm saying, but I'm seven minutes late right now. And so um, he said, and, and the final thing, John is that I, I'm really sorry to say I won't be seeing you in two weeks. And what John thought was he thought that the doctor was telling him he was going to die in that two-week period, and he actually ended up dying of unknown causes unrelated to, and I believe that comes from a book, an older book called um, Confessions of a Medical Heretic, which was written by a medical doctor, but I'm not 100% positive. So that's acting on the one side, but play acting on uh, the other side. And I'm just going to tell a personal story. I'm a surfer. I'm in the sun all the time. I was a caddy as a kid. I was in the sun and I have fairly fair skin. And I worry about skin cancer. It's a natural thing. And I had a black spot on my cheek. 
and I went to the dermatologist and um, this was in Durango, Colorado, where there's, you know, 6,000 feet or whatever, a lot of sun exposure there. And so she had seen a lot of this and she takes a look at it under the microscope. And as she's pulling her face back, I saw a look of extreme worry on her face. It was just, and I was like, oh my God, I've got melanoma and I'm a dead man. And uh, they took the biopsy. They sent it away. It ended up being a benign blue nevus, no skin cancer. But during that 10 day period, she really scared the, she scared me so bad just from a look. So, so um, medical hexing can go the opposite way. And um, yeah, a lot of the times the doctors are play acting because for chronic diseases, Conventional medicine still doesn't have a whole lot of of uh, of options. Anyway, thoughts on that, Ruth? I um I spent a lot of time on the doctor patient relationship, and personally, I think um, my hypothesis, and I believe very strongly, is that the doctor patient relationship underlies the whole medical experience. Now, my dad was a private practice physician, um, and and so I've been following. And he was he's my hero and my idol. And I worked wow. in his office, and he was amazing at what he did. He spent a lot of time with his patients, uh, and he was just he was very good with them. Um, and I've been watching kind of the medical industry that I can remember since about the '80s, and kind of how it's evolved over time. And I've done just so much research on so many different aspects of that. But I believe that what's really important is continuity of care and the doctor-patient relationship. And as you say, it's this aspect of trust, which underlies the story that you told about the guy who was seen as doctor regularly. And I think that sadly, that all of the ad advancements or the way that the healthcare system has evolved, all every single one of the changes almost has served to kill the doctor-patient relationship. And, and it's it's really sad. Um, but I was doing this uh, reading about kind of this issue and the trust and the importance of trust. And I read this really amazing story and it was talking about this, this workshop or seminar that was done um, in a medical setting. And the question is, is what do patients want from their doctors? And what they did is they went around the room and they put butcher paper on the walls. And they said, when I go to my doctor, I want, and they left like blank things and people at the seminar, there are a lot of people would go in and like write in kind of what they wanted. And so there are all different variations on, you know, what I'm looking for and what I want and what my expectations are. And what most of the people said is, I want to be heard. I want to oh. be reassured. And so it's this idea that you go to the doctor and the doctor touches you very warmly and says, everything's going to be all right. And that type of reassurance and just being heard, you know, this hurts. And the doctor says, yeah, that, that must be really difficult for you. You know, oh, yeah. the empathy and the, you know, validates you as a person. And as we move to more technology and more robotics and everything, you're just completely stripping the experience of any of that humanity and human contact, which I think is so necessary in hmm. so much of the, the doctor patient visit and what patients are looking for. And so I don't think it's going to go well. Well, and I noticed uh, I've been in the hospital a couple of times. I had a pretty bad fall and uh, surgery in 2003. And then I, in the, oh, probably about 10 years or so ago for about a three-year period there, I had a, a bout with kidney stones and I had been, I had actually had to be hospitalized at least once for that. And what I noticed was, all the nurses are per diem. And so I would be like, are you coming back tomorrow? Oh, no, I would have loved to have seen them tomorrow, but they're not. Or they'd be at a different hospital or on a different floor. Um, so this lack of continuity of care. But to touch on this thing of empathy, there's an ancient article from um, October of 1967 
in the, I don't even think it exists. I don't know how long it was, but the Journal of Clinical Hypnotherapy. And it was like an N of two study or something along those lines on similarities between hypnosis and psychedelic states. And there was a two-way arm where the, the hypnotherapists would at different times switch roles and the observation of the author was that wow john will give his name because i think that was his name i can't remember the woman's name uh your hypnotherapy skills have improved after your psychedelic experience could it have been that there was more empathy? Could it have been that there was a, 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 a psychic open opening or anything like that? Um, but uh, uh, again, this idea of empathy and what is the what is the thing that we hate about our doctors doing is when I have questions and I'm poo pooed or I'm told that I don't know what I'm talking about and listen to me. A person convinced. This? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the Back at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That. So yeah, the, the hypnotherapy that plays a, a large, it was the early uh, psychiatrists and hypnotherapists who were, I think in uh, discussed in the early psychedelics trials. Yeah, there were a bunch of references too, like from the mid '60s, like '64 to '66. I was like, "Oh I man, I have to." Fifties too. Oh really? Yeah, I was like, I have yeah. to dig into these. They're rich, yeah. but they're also hard to read. They yeah. don't read. Our culture is used to a certain type of, you know, scanning yeah. it quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. Oh, wow. Okay, so so that was that's the the uh, the science of medicine where they were trying to eliminate the um the um placebo effect to the extent possible and the third kind of era of medicine which i call the art and science of medicine started around 2000s and that's when kind of there's research into the mind body connection and there's a recognition that mental states affect physical states and vice versa and now do you have doctors trying to understand these mental states and trying to understand how the placebo effect works so that they can help people get as much from it to cure themselves and improve their, their sense of well being? And so, in that area, that's been really fascinating. That's when there have been a lot of study of the placebo effect and how it works. And you get this, this recognition that. Things like, you know, the white coats and and the the doctor's office and the setting and, you know, the things that you mentioned about um, taking down your insurance, um, things like the size of the pills, whether they're small, medium or large, the color of pills, the shape of pills, I, it, all of this stuff is coming out that it matters. Um And there were, let's see if I remember these three different areas, different areas on um where they're trying to better understand the placebo effect so they can take advantage of it. One is the mind-body connection, so it's the health and wellness area. The second area, the second area is they're trying to understand why certain people experience a placebo effect or a stronger placebo effect, whereas others don't. And this is kind of interesting because they discovered, and this is going back to how during the second period, how to minimize the placebo effect. What they were doing is they were testing the potential survey uh, or study uh, participants, and they were pre-testing them to see whether or not they were susceptible to a placebo effect. And the ones who were very susceptible, they would not include in the study to help minimize, which I thought was a really interesting technique. So they're recognizing that certain people are more susceptible and certain people aren't, and they're trying to understand that. And they've now done actually separate studies. And the way this works is they go in and they give you, say, an opiate. And an opiate will stimulate your opioid receptors. And when your opioid receptors are stimulated, you release um, in your body um, whatever the, the substance is. You would can you give me some of the substances released by your, that your opioid receptors, it's like, 
is it serotonin or those, no, those I, 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 I I don't honestly know for sure. Sometimes compounds will release three uh, serotonin, dopamine, and GABA, typically one okay. of those three. Okay. But I, I can't say that I honestly know with what the opiates are doing. And, and, and certain opioid receptors might do different uh, things as well. Okay. So they're giving people uh, opioids or opiates, uh, stimulate the receptors, and you would get an effect. And certain people have stronger effects than others. So they go and they give the opioid the opi opiate, they would measure the response. And then at some point they would switch to a sugar pill. And they would say, okay, we're giving you now an opiate, but it was really a sugar pill. And certain people then would respond and others wouldn't. And yeah. they could measure the size of the effect. And so yeah. you're essentially training them. Um, and they could see, and they did this separately with opioid receptors, dopamine receptors, cannabinoid receptors, uh, serotonin receptors. And now they're separate. Someone who's um, more um, uh, uh, sensitive to uh, opiate opioids or opiates are not necessarily the same people who are sensitive to say SSRIs or serotonin or dopamine or endocannabinoid system uh, uh, stimulators. Mm -hmm. So the, they're separate areas, but they've repeated the studies or done the studies you know, for these different receptors. And what they've been able to do is trace it back to genes so they can oh, yeah. find uh, genetic variation. So the people who are, you know, bigger responders have very specific uh, genetic variations. And now what this does is it enables personalized medicine. Love this. Yes. So that's the second group of people who are investigating the placebo effect and trying to actively use it in a positive way to improve health and wellness. And then the third group of people who are who are investigating the placebo effect are all the psychedelic people looking at set and setting because the placebo effect is essentially set and setting. That's that is that's phenomenal. OK, so um it brings up a, a bunch of things for me. I, as I mentioned, I'm super interested in flow states, which you know, and I'm just really just a novice, but so is everybody on in that topic of, of conversation. But it seems that our nervous system is able to modify itself. And so I have this idea of we make our own neurochemicals. And so part of what we are doing is enhancing the natural production of our own neurochemistry and there are all kinds of really weird examples in science that if we just took our our blinders off would uh in in and maybe a lot of this is going to have to come from private research if there's too much siloing in academic spaces but it reminds me of a of a completely different study on dissociative identity disorder what is dissociative identity disorder split personalities yep. And split personalities are, are frequently trauma induced from early trauma and the in order to escape the, the, the mind develops these alters and there can be two, three, four, five, six, seven, sometimes even more in rare cases. And there's one study in particular, uh, it was an fMRI study. This person had an alter that was blind, could not see. And so in a clinical setting, you could wave uh, something in front of the visual field and they wouldn't, and th this person wouldn't respond, but <laughs> there was no way to tell if there, it, it, what was happening inside of the, the brain case, so to speak. So they did so, uh, uh, a study under fMRI and this person even though there was activity happening outside, nothing was happening in the visual cortex. It was shut down, completely not even responsive. Um, so that's just from the from the peripheries of science, an example of the extreme power of mental states over physical. Um, and uh, to to get back to set and setting. So much of set and setting is uh, about the life that we live from day to day and to bring in this cell phone thing and your love of 
medicine with technology and humans combined. I don't know very much about this, but I watched a Lex Friedman podcast. You might know who he is. He's an MIT uh, scientist and tech guy. He was saying that the best responses are not from machines or AI, and they're not from humans, but the synergy or the additive effect of the two of them coming together. You're nodding your head. Why don't you take it away there, Ruth, please? I remember following this when they were doing like Big Blue. IBM was doing the uh, some of the early uh, AI stuff, and they were trying. They're playing chess, and they're having grandmasters play chess against the IBM computer, and they were looking at who would win. And it was at that time that they said humans are good, computers are better, but a combination of humans and computers are best. Now, anyone who's ever um, done anything that requires you know, you put in your 10,000 hours and you, you, you know, you're now kind of an expert in your area. Anyone who's done that and knows an area relatively well will know that, you know, there's, there's rules and there's exceptions. And my dad used to say, he says, you go, you go to college to learn the rules, you go to graduate school to learn the exceptions, and then you go to do a fellowship um, to learn the exceptions to the exceptions. <laughs> And so you have these different areas and you know, everyone knows that there's rules out there, but there's exceptions. And so you can program a rule and, you know, an AI is an algorithm, which is following a very clear, clearly defined set of rules. But we know there's always exceptions. And so they're going to miss the exceptions. And so, you know, computers do certain things very, very well, like they can detect things. Um, they have keener senses. One of the cooler, um, I used to go to health IT meetup. And so you had uh, uh, new uh, in innovators, uh, entrepreneurs who are coming up with healthcare technologies. Uh, and these one people, I, they came in and I thought it was the coolest thing. They had, going back to the stethoscope, they had doctors who used the stethoscope to listen to heartbeats of patients. They recorded the heartbeats. And then wow. they um, had a computer uh, interpret it. And the thing is, is there were very, very minute um, changes in the rhythms in the heart that were beyond the ability of people to distinguish. But the computer was able to make those distinctions so they could listen to these heartbeat data and predict, you know, who had a, a problematic uh, heartbeat and predict things like heart attacks or whatever. And so, you know, computers have finer detection and they have greater speed. They can just crunch numbers at a you know an impossibly fast rate, but they don't have they don't have humor. They don't have nuance. They don't have you know they they show um, there are things that little kids can do that computers can't do. You know just because that's what makes people people. They're emergent properties that you can't program in. Well, talk to me then about this in the context of data, and let's use chess as an example. So chess has very defined rules, it's 100% defined rules. So you can pretty much put it in a virtual uh, universe and work out all of the parameters if you have enough calculating capacity. Um, and you mentioned exceptions to the rules in any in any, and then earlier on, you talked about omitted variable bias. Yeah. So in the real world, there is always going to be omitted variable bias, even if we put our entire planet in a uh, in a bubble, so to speak similar to chess rules, just hypothetically, there could still be sun flares or there could still be a comet or an asteroid we haven't thought of. So so I'm going to leave it as an open-ended question, but, but talk about this in the context of omitted variables and AI only analyzes the rules. And I might bring it back, depending on how you go, into some art of swordsmanship from the Japanese Budo perspective. But why don't you uh, take that one away? Because I think you're an expert in this area, Ruth. So I would, I would say any deterministic environment, a computer would probably be better at. Because if you're looking at just, it's deterministic, it's just a matter of which combination presents 
then computers can do all the probabilities. They can look at all the different possibilities and probabilities and figure it out better than a person could. So a chess board, and I'm not a chess person. I know how to play, but I, I don't play. Um, I would imagine that's pretty deterministic. Everything is very clearly defined. The whole universe is right there and nothing can happen outside the universe. But when you go into the world, any, uh, any human interaction is a complex adaptive experience. And when you're talking about complex adaptive systems, then it's not deterministic and anything can happen. And you think have things like black swans. I don't know if you're familiar with those. I am. Yes. And, and yes. so when you go in and if, you know, you train computers and you train AI, it's trained on a data set. So kind of by definition, anything that's not in the data, the computer hasn't been uh, exposed to and doesn't know how to deal with. And I think humans, and this is kind of humans can figure things out now. I don't know how relevant this is, but this is one of my favorite examples of how computers can't figure, you know, computers wouldn't see things the same way as people do. I always say, okay, suppose you're walking down the street and you come to a puddle. What do you do? Depends on how old I am. Depends. That's the, the answer. Depends. <laughs> if I'm a kid, I might just go stomping through it because that's a fun Matter? thing to do, mom. Does it matter if you just found out you won the Nobel Prize? Would you? Does it matter does if it I matter won the Nobel Prize? Ages? That would no, matter to me. Ages. No, What's wait. That? Your age. You said your age, how old you are. Uh -huh. If you're okay. 98 years old and you mm -hmm. find you won the Nobel Prize, you know, does that? I would. So it, I was in, in the park watching a kid, and it was is this little girl, and there's a puddle there. And she was looking at the puddle and looking at it. And she very carefully stepped over it. And then she turned around and stomped through it. Love that. And you could go around it. You could like hop over it. It, it depends on your mood. It depends on a lot. You know, are you wearing your best suit? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> there's an old Irish everything. saying, every path has a puddle. So. I love that. The, I love that. The, the. The exception to the rules are immense because right now we're still, I mean, in our generation, Ruth, we're still primitives in terms of understanding this. And we might be entering a new age of quantum medicine, which totally throws out the rule book in that used to be considered pseudoscience. And then it started becoming somewhat mainstream. And now we're wondering if that even has applications for endocannabinoid system, but, but another story. So yes, these exceptions to the rules and any clinical trial that you design is going to have extraneous variables. Yep. So you're looking at a population curve, but the art of medicine is you have a, an N of one in front of you, a patient in front of you that has so many things that you can't see, although they've been living with it forever. Right. Um, a great clinician i had the opportunity to spend time with said when you're running late what's the most important question that a patient has and i was like what do you mean what are you talking about if i'm running it's like the most important question that a patient has is when you are saying goodbye and leaving the room oh well, there's one more thing i forgot to ask that's the thing that they because they didn't write it down i try to tell everybody write your darn questions down you're gonna forget in the set and setting of the clinical environment. Um, but the better you know your patient, the more you're going to be able to, because the, the limitations of RCTs are immense, including I'm finding out now whether you're taking the red pill or the blue pill or the big one or the little one. It's, it's all, it all makes a difference. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. You know, my dad used to always say, he would tell us, I have, have siblings, and he said he would tell us, you know, whenever you go to the doctor, if it's important, bring someone along with you. The patient is it's in a very, you know, clear state. Now, my brother, he brings, he tape records things because you're going to forget and you're going to focus on very clear things. And this is, you know, another interest of mine is uh, choice architecture, which is uh, the idea, it's behavioral psychology, that the way that you present choices or information to people affects the choices that they make. Yes. And the very, very, very interesting study. And this goes to the way that the doctors present information to patients is also really, really important. 
So they did this study and they said, okay, suppose you have someone who's in the hospital and they have a loved one who needs to have surgery. And the doctor comes out before the surgery and says, there's a 95% chance everything's going to be fine. And then they repeated it and the doctor comes out and says, there's a 5% chance that something could go wrong. Yeah. And you get very different responses from the patient. Now they repeated this where, sorry, that it was the loved one that they're talking to, not the patient. Oh, okay. Okay. Now they repeated it and where the loved one was a doctor or healthcare professional. And they still had very different interpretations or reactions to the way the information was presented. Wow. Wow. There's a, there's a whole area out there and this is, you you have Nobel prize winners who are studying uh, behavioral psychology and the way information was presented. And there's this uh, idea called prospect theory. um, Okay. That when you're giving people say probabilities and choices, like, would you rather have a 5% chance of winning a dollar or uh, either, either losing, losing money, no, of nothing, you have a 5% chance of getting nothing other way around 95% chance of getting nothing versus a 5% chance of getting a thousand dollars versus, you know, a 50% chance of getting a dollar. Oh Yeah. It changes the whole calculus and it's not, it's, it's, it, it's a big, small decision. It's not, it's not, there's, there's not a nuance of the numbering. Those zeros are important, but we don't really yeah. see them a lot of the time. Yeah. And um, what those is that, that people will, they, they'll take a very small chance of a really large win over essentially a sure thing. Hmm. Hmm. And this is why the lottery is so successful. My dad always said this is a who played the lottery every day, by the way. It's a tax against people who can't do arithmetic. Yeah. But he said, I'm not paying to win. I'm paying for the fantasy because you cannot exactly. win if you do not play. Yeah. And so he could drive around in his, you know, whatever and have his yeah. house in the Bahamas and whatever because he's paying for a movie ticket. We're paying that movie ticket price. And uh, or it's actually movie tickets are way more expensive than lottery tickets now, but they used to be about the same. Was it, did you say prospect theory? Is that what you called it? Okay. So um, the nervous system is funny. And um, uh, 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 the early organization of neural networks grew up in and around uh, searching for food and to a degree avoiding danger. But a huge part of the nervous system originated in terms of getting what we want and avoiding what we don't want. So uh, sense of smell, sense of taste, anything that can orient us towards food. Um, in terms of prospect, a prospect is an orientation. Do I want the thousand dollar maybe chance or do I want the one dollar chance? So so and the orientation, I think, is also important in set and setting because uh, I I think of part of the set and setting as part of it is the actual environment itself. And then another part of it is the sub story that we tell ourselves about what is happening. So there's a sub story element and um, in, and we talked about doom scrolling a little bit back before, but, but one of the funnest things about learning to surf and I'm, I'm not a good surfer, but I love to surf pretty much get my dopamine fix there. So so I know, so I know that there's, I know what a dopamine it feels like, but when you learn that, how do I steer this thing? Oh, uh, it goes, it it goes where I look. It's like better than a magic carpet ride is like, how do you steer a magic carpet? I don't know. But with a surfboard, you look where you want to go. Now, if there's rocks that you don't want to hit, or if there's a person who's in your way that you don't want to collide with, if you fixate on the rocks, that's where your nervous system takes you. If you fixate on the the person that's kind of in your way, it enhances. So, so part of part of the prospecting 
is looking where you want to go. And then that kind of organizes these neurologic networks that are non-verbal. And I think that that a huge, a huge part of uh, a huge part of the healing environment, as you mentioned, is the relationship with the doctor. It's a nonverbal sense of being cared for. And we all know the the neurochemistry of of love or of desire or of jealousy or of envy. These are powerful things that shape and affect our neurochemistry. How to, to put it back to your expertise, I see a lot of negative ways that we are using doom scrolling with technology. What are some positive ways that we can use technology to enhance our health, to enhance our flow, to enhance our sense of well-being? There's, so, um, who's his name? Um, his name is escaping me. Uh, one of the, there were two different groups of um, behavioral psychologists who were looking at uh, choice architecture and this idea of trying to focus on certain things. Um, the This guy who did, he did nudge theory and they did really amazing things. And a lot of it came down to changing the defaults in technology or in your choices. And one of, there are two really interesting, two of the earliest kind of experiments where they got really amazing results is if you go back and, and younger people aren't going to know this, but it used to be the case that when you go to the DMV, they ask you if you want to be a donor, uh, an organ donor if you get into an accident and you, you know, you, you tell the people at the DMV and then they kind of mark it on your record and the default and the default means if people don't answer, which a lot of people just don't answer the question, the default is no. Sure. And so they had, and I'm just pulling numbers out, low numbers, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% of people chose to donate their organs. And what they did instead is they changed the default from no to yes. If people don't answer, we're now going to put yes. And now they got the, the organ donor rate up to like 80%. Hmm. Now, very, very similar thing is when people are in a job, oftentimes they're employed by a company, they're given an option to invest in a 401k plan. Now, most people want to invest in retirement. And the problem is if you say, yes, I want to invest, they give you paperwork and they say, okay, what do you want to invest in? And, you know, which funds or whatever. And that's, that's very overwhelming to a lot of people. Especially so, when you're new on the job trying to do a million things on yeah, your yeah. onboarding. Yeah. So they, you have most people or a huge number of people just don't opt into the 401k plan because it's kind of too overwhelming. So again, they change the default from if they don't respond, they opt out to if they don't respond, they opt in and they just put them in whatever it was, like a safe program or whatever, and they got the numbers way up. Um, and so there are these small nudges um, that can help people do things that they do want to do, but for some reason aren't able to do it. So you're helping you, you know, people do things they would otherwise do. And I distinguish that from people trying to essentially manipulate you and get you to do things that you wouldn't necessarily do given the choice. Um, Just the nudge, giving them a little nudge. And you see that going on tremendously on, on the web. And, and so this, you, you always had, this kind of manipulation going on, it's as old as the hills, but it's become very powerful since about the 90s, 2000s. And there's been a confluence of events. And and one is um, it used to be the case that, yes, you know, you always had advertisements. Um, you watch TV and you had ads and everything, but it was relatively it, it was not that often. I mean, how long did people spend watching TV? Some people spend a lot of time, but most people, you know, maybe a couple hours or reading the paper or whatever. It wasn't that much time. And it was always one way and kind of mass, you know, there you go, you know, you take an ad in the newspaper and you're getting anyone who reads the newspaper, which is kind of a slice of everyone. But starting with the internet, all of a sudden, 
And as people now are increasingly spending time on on their phones and on screens, they're now connected to screen time. So they're they're present and able to be be influenced through, you know, a huge portion of that 24 hour day. Now, two things become really, really powerful. One is the fact that when you're on your phone, someone's speaking to you personally. It's now tailored. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then the third piece is all the tracking information where they're able to, you know, get direct feedback from you to know what works for you. And so not only are they able to give you ads, but they're able to give you ads that you particularly are going to be vulnerable to. They know me. They know me better than I know. They know when I've been sleeping and they know when I'm awake and they know if I like yep. blues or reds and they know if everything about us is being measured. Uh, I don't know if that's the case in other countries. I, I have a buddy who um, he is quite a bright guy and he did, he did his PhD in mathematics at university of Frankfurt. He's an American guy, but he says that he doesn't think that the Germans are allowing these tech companies to collect data on them. Wouldn't it be nice to get paid instead of me having to pay a, Google so that I can use Google that because Google's getting all my data. I'm yep. writing all my things in Google docs. They're just those language models with, yep. they paid me for my information. That would be a beautiful uh, change of things. But I, I, I asked my nephew about this and he's a young tech tech savvy entrepreneur, bright guy. And he's like, uncle Jake, I don't care. They can know whatever about me they want. Because he never lived in an area of privacy. Right. I don't want everybody to know everything. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. No, I, I, I ran a meetup on game theory um, and I was presenting a lot of these different types of scenarios and just having people discuss them and kind of different strategies. And, and I had some younger people and I would, you know, ask them very specific and pointed questions and they definitely have very different beliefs. You know, I, you know, there's a young woman and I said, you know, what do you think about the, you know, getting, you know, the recommendation engines and the fact that, you know, all these very personal ads and she's, you know, they're taking your data actually. And she says, well, if it's giving me better ads, then that's fine. If it's giving me better, if it's giving me better TikTok videos, I'm, I'm happy about that. Well, uh, again, this is the set and setting and, uh, and um, my, my, my mom was, there was a big snowstorm in New York and I can't remember the big, uh, airport there. Is it O'Hare? Is it LaGuardia? I can't remember. Anyway, um, she and her husband, so this must've been before the cell, before really cell phones were big, but it was still early tech era. She said, uh, Everything got shut down. The electricity was out. People had to interact. There were people like sitting on the carousels. So the people that were carrying uh, instruments brought their brought their instruments out and were singing. And she said they had a wonderful time. I don't know if younger generations socialize like we do when forming groups. Because remember, uh, well, I'll just say when I was a kid, you got a bunch of kids together and all spontaneously you pick the game, you pick the rules, you pick the teams, you had to police yourself. No, you were out of bounds. No, I wasn't. Oh yeah, you were Lisa. What do you think? Oh, I didn't see it. Okay. Bill, what, you know, and, and we would, we would work it out without a superstructure. Um, the, the, the set and setting of the human architecture is different now. And to go back to the point is, you know, Plato and Socrates didn't like it either, or at least in that generation. Um, but what I'm seeing is, is change happening fast. And with these increases in suicide rates uh, with kids um, raises a, a lot of question marks. Any thoughts on that? Or I do have an, another question to, to segue, but let me know what your thoughts are on that. Because it's a technology question, really. I think it kind of goes back to the, some of the points I was making about the doctor-patient relationship is while people are, it's a paradox, while they're increasingly connected to more and different people, 
they're also increasingly isolated. They're physically isolated. They're not touching other people. I think humans need touch. And I'm sure you're aware of all the studies that have been done about like the baby monkeys where oh, yeah. they, didn't, they didn't touch them, you know, and they go insane. People need to be touched and they need human in-person physical contact. And there's I a couple, yeah. There's a couple of really cool studies. One is the Harlow monkey study, where the 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 there was a wire caged mom with a bottle, and yeah. then there was a, a like a teddy bear mom, not yeah. real, but the teddy the, the the infants that had the teddy bear. But you know, humans really need all animals need touch. Um, uh, in mammals, I won't I won't talk about it because our 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 audience might not understand it. But there's a reflex that happens when mothers clean their children that helps everything work and and believe it or not at the at the beginning of the 20th century a newborn infant who who's who was adopted as a newborn had over a 95 percent fatality rate in the orphanages yeah. if they would almost all of them die and it was only until I, one of the caregivers started noticing that if she held them and nurtured them, that they would survive a lot longer. But humans without touch early on, we, we lose all of that. And to segue into an endocannabinoid system a little bit, because I want to ask you a cannabis question. I really do. Uh, but um, uh if you take mouse pups, newborn baby mouse pups, and you block their endocannabinoid system, they don't develop a suckling reflex. And even though they are hungry, they will starve to death because they can't get their mouth musculature coordinated enough to, uh, to, to latch and to start to have the mom express her milk. So, um, uh, you are a cannabis expert, and we have been talking about a lot of things on the periphery, which have been fascinating. I, I just want to get your take, maybe with the whole scope of all of this, what do you see as some big opportunities, perhaps, in the cannabis industry? Or what do you see as some of the big blind spots in the cannabis industry? I know there's a bunch. So personally, in the area of medical cannabis, I've been fascinated by the, the technology. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and I think I think the biggest areas are going to be um, bioavailability, which they are getting much better with, but targeted delivery. Oh, yeah. I think that's going to be really, really important. And obviously, also specific formulations and mm -hmm, personalization. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I've been seeing uh, uh, and actually spoke with a few people on calls about handheld products that interact with the products and the COAs in there. And uh, in, in, I know there's one in Canada where everything is nationalized. So they're just pulling in a huge stream of data and how helpful that can be for patients to uh, to understand that. Because the thing about botanicals is there's so much variability and also the, the darn receptor system so variable. Um, Actually, when, when I came to cannabis and I was helping my brother try and figure it out and we started getting some results, he's an engineer. And he's like, we need to design a technology to help other people through this process. So we started, we designed one of these tracking systems. The problem is, is the COAs weren't available and they're still oh, not really available here in the States. Not but, in the U.S., but in in, in in and you Canada, can't they are. do anything if you don't have that data. So correct, it's kind correct. Of, um, um, but I would agree with you. Yes, that information is very helpful. What could the cannabis industry do better, in your opinion? There are a couple of really big areas. I think the first is testing to make sure that the, the products people are getting are clearly, accurately labeled. Um, and that the products, um, it, the whole testing procedure, uh, first it was they weren't being tested and now they're being tested, but the numbers are being fudged. They uh, are because there's a monetary incentive. It's a terrible thing. Um, what about breakdown of cannabis products, CBA? I, is... Yeah. So. Um, the, and shelf life. Yes. Um, let me address the first one. This is a big, big issue I have 
I've been watching as the industry evolves, you start in every state, they start with medical, obviously, and it's they build up and they get a real big base of medical users and, and medical dispensaries and medical products in those dispensaries. And then at some point, the states generally um, adopt um, or legalize adult use. And what happens is adult use swamps recreational use. And in every state, it's invariable. Um, the the rec adult use swamps recreational or medical. Sorry, medical. Thank you okay. for yep. adult use swamps medical, and so it because going through the medical system, you have to get your card, you have to pay for your card, you have to go to the dispensary and whatnot. And a lot of patients, I believe, for it's it's cheaper, it's less con it's more convenient. They simply stop going the medical route and switch over to the adult use route, and. Um, at the same time, just the volume of sales in adult use is greater. And so what's happening in every single market is as soon as you get the adult use, essentially the medical market dies off. And that includes a lot of the support. You have, you know, the nurses or the service providers trying to cater to the medical group. They can no longer make any money. And so they- That's, That they happened to me in my practice in Washington, 100%. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Something but, just but, happened. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I cut you so, off. Yeah. I apologize. So now the problem is, is if, well, now all the, all the, if you say, well, okay, well, it shouldn't be a problem because all the dispensaries can just do both. They can do adult use and they can do medical and the medical should be able to go there and everything's peachy keen. The problem is, and, and I know because, you know, I've helped people, you know, I say, people say, well, what should I use? And I say, well, where are you? And I go on to, you know, Leafly or Weed Maps or whatever, and I find dispensaries near them. And I say, okay, if you go to this dispensary, here's the product that you should be looking for. And I'm looking in these dispensaries and they, they don't have anything. They have all the products are high THC products. They might have one or two CBD products. I have found in my research and the technology we're designing that the ratios are really important. The ratio of CBD to THC, you know, some people want, you know, alt CBD. Some people want, you know, an even mix or a heavy mix of CBD, you know, and then of course you have the, the other cannabinoids, CBN, CBG, CBC, or whatever. And if you go to the adult use dispensaries, you don't have any of those products. You might have one or two CBD products, but that's it. And so you're just losing out, which is really a shame. I think the way that the regulators could address this, there is a way because there are plenty of people doing research and developing products that are very varied in their offerings and geared towards specific conditions. So all they need to do is allow direct to consumer sales. Oh, wow. If you could go to, you know, the product site, the, the, you know, the brand's website and yeah. order directly from them and yeah. have them deliver or ship well, we it. Can, we can ship medications, no problem. So, you know, ah, yeah, very interesting, cool. Ruth. I, ha I mean, it's amazing that I didn't think about it because it's a, I don't want to call it a brainwashing, but, but. It's I'm I'm like the elephant that has that's tied the circus elephant that's tied up by this little rope. I'm not even trying to bust out of the current paradigm, and it's just one step out of the way there. Fascinating. Yeah, because these small products they can't get onto the shelves in the dispensaries because they don't have enough volume. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, the number my, my number one when when I was seeing cannabis patients and I don't anymore because it's, there's, there's, it's, the medical has been decimated, but my number one concern was not whether it was going to be effective, it, but was, were they going to be getting too much THC and have a bad experience? And that's, if there's only one product out of several hundred including concentrates and everything else that has a small amount of thc and that one doesn't happen to be perfect for this patient a lot of the times they'll give up a lot of people will try it once or yeah. maybe two or three times and if it doesn't work and it's it's a shame because i i do what i tell my what i would tell folks is there are more kinds of cannabis than there are types of dogs yeah. And just like some dogs are not appropriate for you or for your family or for anybody, 
some cannabis is not going to work for you. Some people do not need a, a Great Dane. They definitely don't need a Great Dane. Um, and, and so, um, very and that, interesting. Now, and that, Washington, there's another another ahead, big please. problem. One more that's really, really, really important. Um, and it's different because if you go to adult use, a lot of people like, you know, show me something new. I want to try something new. But if you're talking about a medical patient, once they find a product that works, they want to be able to get that same product. And that's also a huge problem in cannabis is, you know, they'll finally find the product and then it gets discontinued. Or if it's flower, they can't find exactly the same profile because it's a plant and, you know, the, the profiles change. But if it's a product, a lot of times, I mean, there was a great product out there um, called Kin Slips, which were some, they were like Listerine strips. Do you remember those? Uh, okay. The strips, uh, yeah. I'm not familiar with that product. It was, well, Listerine strips are these, you know, little strips and they come in a little packet and you pull it out and it looks like, like a little piece of tissue paper and you stick it under your tongue and it dissolves. So it's no fuss, no mess. It's completely non-threatening. So there's a, an older woman who's having problems with like allergies or whatever. And I recommended those and she loved them. Um, and the people who are using them all love them because, I mean, it's a single serving. You just take out a strip and put it under your tongue. And the guy couldn't make money. I think he went out of business. He, I think maybe he started producing a hemp product, but his, he had, you know, he had high THC, high CBD and an even mix or something. And it was a great product and he couldn't make it. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate, and and it's very personalized that way. It absolutely is, um, and it's also very time intensive. And I don't know how. I know UCSD University of uh, California San Diego is cutting edge of this, and so um, I have a colleague down there that I can't wait to chat with her and hear because how are they fitting this into the current pay structure of big institutional? medicine and i don't know how they do that but she seems to feel that they've worked that part of the problem out but what one of the problems as i see it is cannabis is very education intensive they don't necessarily need to get the education from the doctor but the doctor should have an idea and also somebody somewhere has to develop that relationship as you said because botanical medicine is very personalized and it's not because we're putting eye of newt in there and we need it but but because there are a lot of things to consider including the whole where do you get the products problem um yeah so you have they have conflict of interest laws that are preventing and this is a huge problem as well there are you have a doctor who's working with the patient and says, okay, here's the type of product you need. And the patient goes to the dispensary and not only can they not find that product, but in regular medicine, what happens is the doctor, and this is very interesting. You go to your regular doctor, he gives you a prescription, you go to the pharmacy. There's two really, really important aspects of that is first of all, the doctor knows that whatever pharmacy you go to, they're going to be able to fill your prescription. They have it everywhere. And second, they know that the pharmacist is required to fill that very medicine. The pharmacist can't say, why don't you try this product instead? No, they and, have to call the doctor or communicate with the doctor. Yeah. And then now, they... I have issues about control because I what I love about cannabis is the patient empowerment and the ability of patients to drive their own care. Unfortunately or fortunately, whatever, it is what it is. Most patients don't want that. They want to just tell me what to take. Um, but what you have, what I hear so often is the doctor says, this is the type of product you need. They go to the dispensary. The dispensary says, yeah, we don't have that, but this product will really help you, which it won't. And so you have this big problem. And what you need then is to have the doctor have a relationship with the dispensaries. Now that ah. led forward, but the yeah, conflict right. of interest laws prevent that relationship. Doctors cannot have any sort of interest. So the pharmacies can't pay the doctor. Now, obviously that can go wrong. You can get payoffs where the doctor's given bad product, blah, blah, blah. But it's goes back to cannabis is just very complex. Yeah. And the whole conflict of interest in the, some of the laws, I was, um, I was in a, 
corporate meeting with one of the ver- with attorneys from one of the very largest cannabis companies on the planet. Big at one of well, we won't say exactly which one, but one of the three biggest cannabis companies in the planet. Uh, and the, they, um, I was because I was designing an education program, an in-house education program for them, and they didn't like it because I was giving information to the sales reps and to the executives about benefits. And they said, they said, Jay, and I got pulled in with my boss and they said, Jake, there are no medical benefits for cannabis. So not because there weren't, but because from their legal perspective, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. So no, <sighs> I understand the conflict of interest, but right now the conflict of interest is on the deficit of education for the patients because, and and for the doctors as well, because I've written courses for doctors and you can write a course for doctors, but doctors will tend not to want to purchase your course unless it has a category one CME certification. And I've written those and then, then, then they can get their CME credits and then they can use it. They can write off it. It's an expense and they can write it off. Um, but, but the whole rest of the education change, there's also this uh, concept of conflict of interest and the companies can't make medical claims. And that bud tender that you talked about that said, oh, we don't have that product, but try this. That's, this should work. That's medical advice. That's a big no-no. I mean, that nobody's getting in trouble for that, but well, they can say this will work. They can't say this will, you know, cure your pain. Yeah, I this guess will help your arthritis. Experiment. They can't say that. Yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> I mean, the acrobats that you know the word acrobats that go that goes on around you know the words you can. Well, I found that you know other customers tell me that. This- in my experience, <laughs> funny, funny. Um, we are coming to the end here, Ruth. It has been a great pleasure. We still have a little bit of time. Um, is there anything that you want to talk about that we haven't gotten into yet? Um, I would like to hear from you about how cannabis can help with the flow experience. Great question. Uh, I think it is, again, very personalized. And I think that the part of the personalized experience has to do with THC on one side, and maybe a certain part of it has to do with other cannabinoids and terpenes on the other. So I'll talk about one first and then the other. Um, And I'll use it in my context of flow as a surfer. Uh, um, Part of... Part of the flow experience with surf, part of the surfing experience is, uh, I don't know if it, I don't know what percentage of it, but a huge percentage of us are in flow states. And, and for me, it's not only when I'm on the way, but when I'm navigating out through the currents and not always getting through, because sometimes it could be uncomfortable getting under or over waves to make it out to where you want to be. The, the reading of the ocean is a pleasant flow experience for me. I love it. I love it. I love to get a feel when I'm in a current and I ride a big long board with a kind of a D fin and I like to get my board situated so that I'm getting a little push from my fin, kind of like the sail of a, of a ship. Um, I'm in flow a lot of the time when I surf and I don't really use cannabis recreationally or spiritually anymore, but I sure have more than my 10,000 hours in and both uh, uh, probably on the waves, uh, but definitely with the cannabis. And there is a point in time where the waves are too big and the THC does not improve my flow at all. There is a little bit of a delay in muscle response. And I do not like how when the situation gets difficult and I get out of breath and I'm having to be underwater and I'm out of breath I don't like that at all with THC when it's big, but when it's medium or little, it's so much fun. And uh, I feel that I am in better connection with the humans around me 
um, because th there's kind of a, of a moving for position out there. And one of the real fun things for me when I have is the sensation, and I don't have a whole lot of data about this, is I feel like I'm able to read the ocean better. So I'm navigating with, it's kind of a game experience, right? So you're in a pack of people and there is, there are rules that most people follow, but beginners don't understand. So how, okay, I have to identify who are the beginners out here? Who are the people that don't know the rules that might get in the way? That's a fun thing. The THC helps me with that. At least I think it does. Um, and then reading the ocean, sitting on my board and looking out and trying to predict what the ocean is going to be doing, not minutes in the future, well, sometimes minutes in the future, but 60, 70 seconds in the future. I really get a sense that I am better at that when I'm using THC. Uh, and a lot of the times I'm not, as I said, I'm not a great surfer, but I ride a big old longboard. And a lot of the times I will catch as many waves as a lot of people. So I, I have a pretty high wave count when I'm, I'm surfing. And at the very least it's pleasurable. There's a sense of time shifting. Uh, there's a sense of, I get that dopamine rush where I, when I'm out of the water, I can't wait to get back in again. Um, there's instantaneous feedback. So I'm getting instantaneous feedback for how I'm doing. And I, I love it. So um, that's the THC side. I would say that, on the other, go ahead. That sounds very, first of all, the, the social relationships is prefrontal cortex, but what you're describing about the experience seems very like right brain to me. It's it, almost like being in a flock of birds, how they would think to navigate that space where they're all together in this. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I don't know how that ties into, I, I'm trying to think that it's helping you with the big picture. So you're saying it's frontal, right, right, right cortex frontal. I, I don't know the difference between, or I, I know that the prefrontal cortex is your social relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know that your right brain has to do with kind of more bigger picture and yeah. sensation and emotion. If I'm not mistaken, in in the limited flow research that we have, there is a transient hypofrontality in the left and an upregulation in the right. But I'll have to go back uh, and examine that. Um, oh, that's cool. A good question for me to to dig into. On the other cannabinoid side, um, I can only talk about two. Uh, one is CBD. Um, I get the sense that when I am using CBD, some I would typically, how I'm thinking of this is as an oral, um, I have better stamina. I have better blood sugar control. It seems that I am able to stay out there much longer it's too bad i don't really use thc anymore because i would love to know how the thc cbd combination would affect things but this cat's not going to be doing that but i definitely get the sense that uh i am definitely able to stay out there longer and you know i'm i'm an I, i'm a an older athlete uh, and kind of like the 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 dog with the gray and his snoot who keeps chasing the ball too many times and you got to tell him, to, you know, the owners have got to take him back or he's going to be limping later tonight. That's me. I don't have that when I use THC. Um, but what I think is the most profound thing that I've realized. CBD. CBD, I apologize. Yes, CBD. Yes. So I, I can I can play longer and recover better. The topicals, both before and after, really help with sore muscles. But the coolest thing I've discovered lately is cold tolerance with beta caryophylline because I surf in Washington. We're in neoprene year-round. Even in the summer, we wear a wetsuit because that water's cold. It never gets above, hardly ever gets above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the winter, it's down in the 40s uh the cold tolerance with bcp is profound i use that as an oral and i don't i do not do cold i'm a cold wimpy 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 cold in fact i didn't surf in washington for many years because i thought it was too cold 
but we have technology now and that that makes it possible so in the flow state if you're too cold you're not having fun you're done the the, the limbs don't work right it's just and it's it, it's not fun so the cannabinoids can enhance the pleasurable aspect for sure and i don't have data other than um i don't really count my waves but i know if i've had a big wave day or not you know is it a 50 wave day that's a long day out there um I think that the, the the THC helps me navigate the pack and also kind of have, it, it, it couldn't be, I don't believe in sixth sense, but a nonverbal sense of where I need to be. Um, any thoughts or questions on that? No, that's, it's very interesting, the different nuances there and the interplay between the different cannabinoids. Have yeah, you and the have you read that? No, no. This, nobody, I wouldn't think anybody would be interested, but apparently they are. And, and I'll probably take this out and do a short clip. So thank you so much for uh, for that question, for bringing that out. Um, uh, I have not written that up. Um, and I'll be... Yeah, uh, because it, I mean, it, it has implications outside of, you know, broader, if you generalize it to the similar types of situations. There's yes. a lot going on there, a lot of nuance, and it's, you yes. know, personal data points. So. Yes, yes. Um, and I won't I, I won't say for myself, because I haven't done this, but uh, I do like, I, I, I have done this, is I like to night surf. I do. And usually for me, what happens is it's a sunset session, and it's just getting darker, and I stay out there. It's dangerous because the most dangerous thing about night surfing is, you know, what if there's a big log in the water that you don't see uh, kind of a thing. Um, but uh, as surfers tend to be experimental, I know a lot of guys who are experimental with surfing who will microdose psilocybin in the summertime at night because we have that bioluminescence and I will go surfing out there, but I have not tried the, um, but they say you can see so much better at night. And I, I think that we're all in flow out there because your visual cortex is bringing in less information. So you're paying more attention to proprioceptive information, listening for the white water, as opposed to looking back and seeing it. Plus, it's easy to get distracted when you've got a streak of blue. It's just the most magical, um, magical thing and, and not safe. I don't recommend it for, for people with children. Um, but uh, flow that states. Balance issues. You're up and down. Does that. I, oh, there's definitely balance. There's definitely balance issues because usually there's not in yoga. We call it a drishti is where you're focusing on a point to help maintain your balance. You don't have that as much. Uh, at night sometimes you can focus on a, a light that's in the distance but but usually where i'm talking about there's not a whole lot of light pollution but what um, about on psychedelics does that affect your balance uh so if you're my underwater. experience is my experience is, is underwater i don't know especially in the dark it could get pretty scary i would imagine if you get held under and i would imagine you don't want to have any accidents happening um, because that could freak you out talking about set and setting. Um, so so these are things that are not advisable, but uh, I just thought I would bring it up. I, I've noticed there's a proprioceptive element for all, certain types of flow states. And I think a lot of, um, I, I think auditory environments are also, super conducive to flow whether that be music orientation um i had a non-drug induced psychedelic experience this summer at the grand canyon um it was a full moon and i was on i think it's the south rim on a bicycle and it was crowded in the daytime so i would bike i biked and i found this beautiful spot with this wide uh, open vista area. And I was excited to see the canyon under moonlight because it was so beautiful in, um, in the daylight. 
and the sun popped down and the moon popped up and the visuals were not as stunning by any stretch with the moonlight. I thought it would be fantastic, but it just, just the colors disappeared and everything. But, but I was on this field and the crickets were singing and I closed my eyes and I could hear the crickets on the plane where I was, but they were also in the Canyon. So I could hear the crickets singing in the Canyon, which is a big Canyon. And I could hear some of the direct uh, songs of the cricket. And then I could hear the echoes off of the wall and it just took me to a different place. I think I must have sat there for a half hour, 45 minutes, and I only thought that three, four minutes went by. Um, so I think part of flow states can involve accessing cranial nerve inputs that we don't usually think of. By cranial nerve, I mean auditory, even olfactory, um, visual, like if you're painting or something like that, painters will get into a flow state. Um, that makes me think of, I remember the first time I was hearing surround sound. Especially like on a home theater system. Oh, yeah. 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 The bass is kind of unidirectional, but all the peripheral. Um, and for me, the first time I heard that was was in a movie theater. But I think that I think that um, that is uh, the eighth cranial nerve hearing on the auditory branch and um, balance is the cochlear branch and i and in certain states so so some of these circuits have bandwidth and so sometimes if there are certain situations certain things will get turned up or turned down uh if anyone has been in a, a near motor vehicle accident or some sometimes sensation of time really slows down and also things will sometimes go quiet even though there's a lot of cacophony around you that's that eighth cranial nerve auditory down regulating so that the balance aspect can upregulate. but i think that 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 the cranial nerve inputs physically can do all deliver pleasure and one of the most underrated ones for set and setting not necessarily for flow is olfactory nose so put on some nice incense or some essential oils you can change your space instantaneously put on some music and some essential oils boom all of a sudden light a couple candles now all of a sudden you've got uh visual is different auditory is different olfactory is different the whole setting setting has uh evolved you're going to see some really really interesting experiences with virtual reality and the combination of virtual reality and psychedelics and things like auditory and olfactory stimulation you know imagine putting together kind of you know an experience I, I saw that they were working on the olfactory piece somewhere, and I thought to myself, uh, uh, it's primitive. I wonder how it's going to go, but talked about, talked about omitted variable bias, how to replicate that. Now, I think you can do it with big stuff, but there's a paper from an extremely reputable peer review. I'm thinking it's nature. If, if you give me a second, I, could, I might be able to, to pull it up real quickly here the human nose and i was astounded by this number ruth because it's got a lot of zeros um in this paper an accurate nose meaning not smoking cigarettes or whatever can receive approximately one trillion i'm not i'm gonna source the paper olfactory inputs and I'm going to say some things. I don't know if it's true for you, but remember how your grandma's house smelled? I yeah. do. I do. I remember how, and I, I remember how the ocean smells in La Jolla because that was my home break as a kid. And, and uh, so the smell or 
the old musty smell of the locker room in high school. I remember that. So, so the, yeah. the old factory is very much involved in set and setting. I think that's the going to be the final frontier for psychedelics because we'll be able to do the visual pretty quickly and the audio pretty quickly. But the combination of those two, there's going to be some additive, maybe some synergistic. But, too. Yeah. But the olfactory is so hardwired because it's a it's a pleasure seeking. I mean, we don't do it anymore, but how do you find the food? And and uh, indigenous peoples can smell water. I don't know where I am, but I smell water. <laughs> I've never yeah, smelled. Bring me back to that uh, LinkedIn post where you commented. I was saying how uh, dogs have more CB receptors in their cerebellum, and you said, "Is that possibly why they can smell better than people?" Well, there, there's there's going to be hardware and architecture, and maybe even the nasal concha. I mean, there's probably a whole setup, and also different dogs have different degrees of smell. Anybody with a beagle or a hound knows. They're not the most important thing in their dog's world. I mean, I love beagles, but the beagles are all about their nose. You want a dog that's all about you, get a dog that's a lap dog that likes sitting on your lap. I'm going to try and find this paper. Um, why don't you tell me your thoughts on that for a minute, and I should be able to pull this paper up for everybody. Um, I... I would have to agree. I mean, the smell is, I think, one of the, I, I don't know if it's even more more than music. For me, I'm speaking personally as far as powerful for bringing up memories. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, certain perfumes for reminding me about people and certain smells. As you say, like the locker room, you can remember the locker room or, you know, mm. grandma's apartment or, I mean, my dad, my dad was... He smokes cigars and ah, yeah. I associate that with feeling very safe. And oh, so, so someone else might not like it, but you love it oh, because it's, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. My grandpa, my grandpa smoked a pipe. I love the smell of pipe tobacco. I don't like its taste, but I love, I love how it smells. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure mm. like cleaning agents. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, and you know, there's, I've seen some ads on, on television about this particular um, laundry detergent and the people are smelling it in the, in the laundromat in this commercial and it's yeah. taking them to this beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. So I found it. It's from uh, journal science. It's called humans can discriminate quote humans can discriminate more than 1 trillion olfactory stimuli and quote by C the lead author C Bush did B U S H D I D. Folks can Google that if they want. Um, I was shocked by that number. So, so, um, but the memory factor and thinking of that in terms of assisting with PTSD or the set and setting. I mean, hospitals have a clean smell, and I I did have to put my um help get my mom. Uh, into an assisted living facility it was, took months and months uh before the before the turn of the new year here and honestly <laughs> my my one of my first it probably was my first criteria is i would walk into the place and smell it mm -hmm. i'm there for the smells because i want to know you know who's taking care of business here um yeah so so very cool. Any other, any other thoughts, comments, or questions, Ruth? I can't think of anything. It's It's been such an interesting conversation. <laughs> what an interesting long ride it's been. Uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise. I've learned a lot from you today, and hopefully folks will enjoy this. We went into some pretty technical detail um, but I've decided for my small and growing audience, I just have to stay on target with this and the right people will find us. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ruth Fisher, Ruth, tell folks how they can find you. Um, I'm uh, very active on LinkedIn uh, and also at my website, Quanta, Q-U-A-N-T-A-A. -A -A. Um, and my book, The Medical Cannabis Primer, 
Uh, there's a website for that. So medicalcannabisprimer.com. Wonderful. Ruth, thank you so much for your time. I'm Dr. Jake Felice with Sweetwater Holistic, and I very much appreciate you listening. Okay, there's a nice little pause there. I'll just snip it. Thanks so much. Wow, we had fun and we covered some really cool topics, totally off script. There was definitely yeah. some flow in there. Yeah, yeah, a lot of really interesting stuff. What did you find most interesting personally? Um, the idea of I, set and setting is so intriguing to me. And we didn't get to some of it. There's, um, and I forget their names, um, but they're, they talk about meaning and the meaning that people attribute to everything. And one of the things that I've been thinking about um, before, you know, this morning was the cultural attitudes towards something. And so you go in and I was thinking about, I'm looking at, um, dispensaries and, oh, uh, economic uh, benefits and costs associated with legalizing cannabis. And they note that dispensaries tend to get put in zoned in, in lower socioeconomic uh, areas. Oh. And you can imagine you're creating, you know, this cultural attitude. I'm thinking if, you know, if the dispensaries are on Park Avenue, then you create a completely different mood around the the use and 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 activities involving cannabis when yeah. you put them in you know the dark side of town that doesn't help and right next to whatever uh <laughs> the pawn shop right next door or whatever yeah and i would imagine of course the economic aspect of that is uh we uh we want to go where there's a lot of people and we want a relatively affordable rent situation. Uh, so we're going to uh, tend to avoid the high end stuff. Now you're in um, Bay Area, correct? So I, I'm more familiar with the LA kind of cannabis uh, thing, but uh, what was the name of the company that had all the higher end um real estate where they were out of med men they went belly up i think yeah, they did. i don't know how they were and I know, I know they have they had some shady goings on but but they had some really high-end real estate that they were operating out of but not many and i did i remember when i first saw them i was like oh i want to try and get involved with this organization i sent them some correspondence i never heard back from them so whatever probably a good thing yeah right <laughs> There's a topic that I think about um, a lot that I find very intriguing, and that's a cannabis community. And it goes to kind of the issue that's going on in society with the smartphones, the loneliness and the lack of, you know, people yeah, yeah, connection. Yeah, and I think yeah. that that's serving, providing this tremendous place for people to be and giving them acceptance. Especially and a lot of the people who had been marginalized before because of their cannabis now they're finding you know an above board community they don't have to do it in the shadows yeah that's that's why i like the co-op model i have i have and that was the early washington medical model it was not a perfect law it was definitely abused on one end um but i also saw it work properly and it was amazing because it was both affordable and educational and it was truly amazing. When you have a true patient-centered co-op, you can have 20, 30, 40, 50 people. And for folks who couldn't afford the medicine, even though they were patients, they could come for a four-hour shift or a six-hour shift. And then, uh, and then certain folks would be grow experts. So they would grow it. And then other people would make the products and you could learn, you could come attend a class on how to do it, or you could just, you could just go over to Mary's place when she's cooking up her cannabis butter and she'll teach you right there. It was so now that would have been post smartphone. I'm, I'm just trying to think of when, 
the rec law came in. Washington was the first or second state. I think it was just right out, like within the same week as Colorado. So I think that was like 2015 ish. So there would have been like 2011, 12, 13, 14 was this co-op era. It was phenomenal. I loved it so much. And I still to this day have doubts. Push back on this, please, because it's my bias. I have doubts that big cannabis can outcompete little co-ops because the the labor input, you don't think so, huh? Um I just some guy on LinkedIn post saying that they're growing a hundred dollars a pound. Okay. Wow. Is that tested? Do they know what's in it? He was he was a seed guy. And he's saying he showed a picture of a grower room and he said they're getting a hundred dollars a pound because they're using a hundred percent of the space for grow. They don't need like areas for the mother plants for the clone, <laughs> no R and D or anything. And they're using all the space. And I think the problem is um, that you have a, this is an aspect of choice architecture. Oh, where yeah, okay. If, well, what I'm about to say, if what you give people choices of, that's kind of how they think of the product. And so if you put it out there and you focus on price, people are going to focus on price. And in a lot of cases, price becomes, you know, to the exclusion of other things. And you have so many people out there, especially some of these crappy growers, that's all they have is price. And so that's what they're focusing on. And that kind of moves people's attention and it puts everything on price. And so if you talk about it, you know, co-op and there's obviously a hell of a lot more to it than that, but they're never going to be able to compete with someone who all they care about is price. Interesting. And so I you, had, go you ahead. Train, and, and, you know, you look at any product out there and you have the mass consumption, you, you always have like, I, I was looking at beer and craft beer is like 25% of the beer market. And I was using that as, you know, how much I think craft cannabis is going to be. I think craft cannabis is a future uh, where, where the quality and the price can can combine. So what what I'm about to tell you may or may not be true because Dr. Zoom might be listening to us. So this might not be true what I'm about to tell you here. But I had a medical card uh, partially from that accident that I referred to back in 2003 where I spent all that time in the hospital and I have a pretty devastating foot injury. I still can't run, but I can walk and I can surf. Um, and topicals work fantastically for me. And so I had my co-op that I was a member of. This may or may not be true. And um, Martin Martinez was the owner. He was the first uh, legal medical patient in Washington back in 96 and a stand-up guy. And I said, Martin... I want to try making a topical for the co-op. And uh, it's like, can I get some material? And uh, he said, sure, swing on by at seven o'clock or whatever. And <laughs> Martin handed me a plastic bag that was the size of a large, hefty bag of trim, not a small hefty bag, a large, and I think I made about three gallons of topicals out of that, and I gave it back to the co-op. I may or may not have kept a little bit for myself for my own personal use, but it was essentially zero priced. Now, it was low quality, but that didn't matter. It was going into a, a topical, and topicals are concentration dependent, So, and people loved it, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, how are you getting this for free here? I, I, I don't know how much it, I would hesitate to say how much it weighed here. Um, but it, it was, it was a large amount. I've never seen that much at that point in time. I was like, wow. So it, well, certainly there's a lot of really good people out there. And if you go and if you look at these grows, they all have trim. <laughs> 
And it depends on, you know, the question is, what are they doing with their trim? And the ones who are more med men like are going to take every little clipping and they're going to put it in that hefty bag and they're send it off to an extractor or sell it, you know, to see how much they can get from it. And someone else who's more like uh, your friend Martinez. Martin, Martin Martinez. Yeah. Um, might give it to co-ops to use uh, it. If they yeah. Can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, cannabis, there's so many really good people and you're always going to have, whether it's legal or not, you're always going to have people doing the right thing. And, and in California, it was the Compassionate Care Act. And what I heard is, you know, the all of medical was small, compassionate care. You know, you have your caregiver with, with you know, taking helping a bunch of independent people. And there's a guy, uh, Mike Robinson. I don't know if you know him. He's down. I, I met Mike and we would both attend uh, American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine meetings in Santa Barbara. I think I went to like seven or eight of them there yeah. with him together. Yeah. So I met him personally. Yeah. yeah. He was heavily involved in the compassionate care industry. And he was the one who told me that um, when, when rec was legalized, the big problem with that is they no longer... Oh, they said you can give cannabis away, but you still have to pay taxes on it. And oh. he said the problem with that is you had people donating either money or cannabis for for compassionate care. And that's going to kill all the donations because people now had to pay taxes on that cannabis. Fascinating. The uh, Washington legislature just passed a rule for medical that is eliminating any tax on it. And so it is looking like an over 30 percent savings for per people with medical cards on the end product, which I, at first I was like, oh, that will motivate some people. But now that I've spoken with you, it still has to be transacted through a dispensary. So that might not motivate the dispensary operators. I don't know. Well, yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, well, you also still have the question of whether, because it's not, you can have very real patient demand and you can have, say, a million dollars in patient demand at a dispensary, but if the dispensary is doing 20 million of rec, they still might not care about and, you know, it's taking up shelf space and shelf space is valuable. And if they're getting, and this is what I keep reading, is the lower volume products, they're just not going to allow space for. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it's retail. <laughs> we got to maximize our- Yeah. Now, I know our... in California, at least for a while, I don't know if it's still going on, it was pay to play where you needed to pay to have shelf space. It was slotting fees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, and so the question is, are the people who are creating these small, everything in cannabis, all the laws are designed, create economies of scale, which means they favor the larger producers and they kill the smaller producers. Mm -hmm. My, my hope is that we just, and maybe, you know, the laws in California, I, I think there are legal adult grows for like four plants in California, but there are certain have to be behind a fence. They can't be visible, et cetera, et cetera. That's all I really care about is if, 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 if that could be a 50 statewide thing that everybody could grow a few plants, that would make me very happy. I think that home grow is going to be a big industry. And I've talked to one guy in New York who was doing education, I said, I bet you're going to have high demand because home grow is not trivial. Mm -hmm. and you're gonna, People are going to need help. And if you can, so this guy's setting up a school. And I said, if you can have a program where you teach, say, coaches who, you know, are kind of like the compassionate care people, but they're taking care of the home grow. They have, you know, 15 clients or whatever who are, they're giving advice and helping them do their grow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I know another guy, uh, a group of guys in LA who have a website that's uh, weed baits that oh. it, um, catering to growers and it's okay. online because all of that's legal. You can get all the equipment and supplies 
And so they're, they're catering to the home growers. Now I know someone else who's tried to grow and she's had a lot of problems. So my understanding is it's not as easy as you might think. Um, also if there's a problem, it's not easy. If there's not a problem, it's easy. <laughs> but it can be, especially outdoor, tends to be easier. I've only grown one time. And it was right after my accident. I was bedridden. I couldn't leave the house for months. And I decided I'm going to make it. This may or may not have happened. It might not be true. But I was going to make it with zero dollars input because I was out. I couldn't work for the next uh, uh, four months because I was in a wheelchair. And uh, um, so I got, uh, may or may not have gotten three um, uh, book size u-haul boxes and created a, a not a cylinder but a square that i may or may not have lined with aluminum foil and i had uh, a quartz lamp inserted at one height and a full spectrum at another and i had a little um may or may not have had a little uh fan heater that was just on the fan that had a little thermostat on it so when it got too hot the fan may or may not have pulled that hot air out and I grew or maybe grew three little plants. And that was a fantastic, wonderful experience. I had no, no grow other than the co-op, but I just did it. I didn't have any problems. Uh, I'm assuming it must've been auto flowering because they all flowered at the same time. And I loved it as a consumer and a user, but my friends just thought it was like, we're not going to say anything because you grew this. So, but they were not going to say it was good. And I thought it was the best ever. So I think that relationship, the relationship of growing, whether it be a garden or your own medicine has some public health benefits. Yeah. yeah. Well, the set and setting thing in the, the whole intangibles. Yeah. Awesome. I would. But the last point I would make is maybe a lot of the complexity comes around trying to optimize yield. Where if you you know if you're satis if you're satisfied with you know moderate yield, then maybe it's not so tough. It's only if you're trying to eke out every last kind of quarter ounce. Right? And and yes, I believe that's true, and that I had not framed it in that way. So that's a great lesson you taught me. I don't think it's hard at all to grow C plus cannabis, A, A plus cannabis. And trust me, it, it's been well over a year since I've had any cannabis. But if, if, if I decide maybe I want to have something, I'm going for top, 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 tippity top shelf because it's, I don't care if it's $10 for a pre-roll. I, I'm, it's, it's my one time this year, even if I ever do that. So, but I also think that if we had a na nationwide legalization aspect, similar to how much of the country's wine is grown in very few areas and is distributed widely, there are going to there are places where wheat is grown and there's places where corn is grown. So there's going to be a gravitation just for the economics of that. And um, for many things, the tip top concentration is not important. Some of some it is. So that's a great point. Cool. Well, Ruth, thank you very much. Uh, would I if I with your permission, because I said I would cut back at the last point in time. Yeah. Would you mind if I snipped a few of these last moments out, if I That's can possibly fine. do that? Okay, great, great. Very much thank you. I look forward to seeing you on LinkedIn.